This micro lecture is on biorefining in North America. When you have a chance, please visit the attached link on a company called Diamond G Forest Products, located in Georgia. This is a modern day pine tapping naval stores business. They are using some more advanced methods and making a high quality tree resin product that is getting attention from local green chemicals producers. In some senses, this is an exciting development because it signifies an attempt to modernize naval stores technology, along with DOE-driven efforts like the Petro program. It's worth thinking about. Please take a moment to review this week's learning objectives. So back to this map. At this point, I hope it is fairly clear that biorefining will not replace oil or coal, but it can improve the entire system by using this strength to help support this demand. We discussed fossil fuels as a carbon source and how consolidated they are compared to biomass, but now we need to consider this in more detail because it directly relates to petroleum refining. Oil is concentrated in select places in huge underground reservoirs and it's pumpable. The United States and North America are covered in biomass, not oil. The vast majority of this oil is only found in a few special areas. Because oil is concentrated in select places in huge underground reservoirs and it's pumpable, oil refineries tend to be massive and centralized. There are only about 150 oil refineries spread across the U.S. after over 100 years of major oil production. These refineries fit the scale and form of their resource, so there aren't very many, and those that do exist are enormous. Compared to oil, there are over 200 corn ethanol plants after about 40 years of major production, and the number keeps growing. Oil refining, on the other hand, is fairly mature, and refineries are closing and consolidating instead of being built. The newest simple oil refinery in the United States began operating in 2008 in Wyoming. However, the newest complex refinery with significant downstream unit capacity began operating in 1977 in Louisiana. So refineries aren't being built that often. As we transition to cellulosic ethanol and new uses for ethanol broaden its markets, it is very likely that the number of ethanol and butanol refineries will expand considerably. For insight into what cellulosic biorefining might look like, we can consider wood processing in addition to corn farming and ethanol production. Biomass is found everywhere, but it's expensive to harvest and move, so wood processing, for example, tends to be smaller and more distributed. There are thousands of wood processors distributed across the U.S. because of the unique aspects of processing biomass. Wood processing has been happening for much longer than oil refining, and where oil refining has settled on about 150 facilities, wood processing utilizes thousands across the United States. This comparison makes an important statement about processing biomass for money and what is likely to be the most reasonable scale for biorefining. It does not make sense to try and build massive biorefineries analogous to petroleum refineries because that scale doesn't fit the resource. If it did, wood processing and corn ethanol would not be as small and distributed as they are after decades and centuries of business development. To succeed, biorefineries must fit the size and location of their biomass resource. Remember, this is where the forest biomass is, primarily in the Pacific Northwest and the South. Minnesota, Michigan, New Hampshire, and Maine are also big forestry states. And also remember, this is where the agricultural biomass is, primarily in the Midwest. Everyone has some, but the Midwest has the most. This is a table from a study that assessed milk production, sawmills, and all U.S. firms engaged in agricultural products. They applied a continuous power mathematical function based on these biomass products businesses to suggest the distribution by size of second-generation biofuel facilities. The USDA believes that biofuels mandates can be met by building 527 biorefineries with an average capacity of 40 million gallons per year. This study refutes that idea because it means the USDA is suggesting that biorefineries should be based on petroleum refining and not on the businesses involved in the production of biomass products. 
Their models suggest that the actual number and size of biorefineries will follow a power law distribution similar to other biomass products industries in developed nations around the globe. Depending on the scenario considered, the number of primary biofuel producers may be in the range of 4,000 to 13,000, with a most likely number of approximately 9,000 primary producers. Because this model is based on similar industries that have been using similar resources for hundreds of years, it is highly likely that this estimate is much closer to reality than the USDA's proposed 500 biorefineries. We cannot forget that biomass is a distributed resource, and therefore it cannot be compared to oil and gas, which are consolidated. This fact permeates every aspect of biorefinery planning and development, and it is very likely that it will take 9,000 small biorefineries rather than 500 massive ones. This model suggests that approximately 84% of the proposed biorefineries would only require 15 to 50 tons per day of biomass. That's not a whole lot. This means that successful biorefineries will need to be economic at fairly small scales, like the town scale or the suburban scale. This also means that the choice of biomass products and markets must reflect the size of the facility. Many commodity chemicals are only commodity chemicals because they are produced at massive scales that take advantage of economy of scale. Most biorefineries will probably not have economy of scale on their side without some form of concentrating or hub-and-spoke model. This is not to say that biomass couldn't be used economically for commodity chemicals, just that it couldn't be done the same way that Petrochem does it. We are definitely making progress. It is exciting to look at the progress of cellulosic ethanol in the last 10 years and think what the next 10 years might hold. We forget that government investment is responsible for a lot of the energy, transportation, and petroleum refining infrastructure in this country, and cellulosic ethanol is another good example. It takes a long time and a lot of money to get industry started and give them a chance to succeed, but if you are persistent and there is a compelling supply and demand, it will probably eventually be a reality. I believe that 30 years from now, cellulosic ethanol will be recognized as just the beginning in a long stretch of commercial technological innovations that allow us to fully leverage biomass chemistries at the same levels we currently leverage hydrocarbon chemistries. Slowly but surely, we are building these cellulosic ethanol facilities. Not all of them will succeed, but some will, and then others will follow their success. It is also important to remember it is not just the U.S. building cellulosic ethanol facilities, but most of the developed world as well. Like we discussed, there are many different biorefining platforms, and though cellulosic ethanol gets a lot of press, the U.S. continues to forge ahead in supporting these developments in all its various forms. So now to wrap this up. Some established biorefining industries are wood pulping, corn ethanol, anaerobic digestion, and biodiesel production. Study of these established biorefining industries will help direct future successes. Comparatively, some growing biorefining industries are cellulosic ethanol, biomass gasification, biomass pyrolysis, algae, and renewable diesel. It will take creativity, economics, and a focus on utilization of waste to establish these industries. Please take a moment and review this integrated biorefineries summary. When you have an opportunity, please visit some of the attached links. They are for companies that are making highly valued biomass chemicals at small to medium scales that fit the biomass resource well. These are specialty and fine chemicals that don't have enormous markets, but they are quite expensive, and making them in a biorefinery has the potential to be much cheaper and easier than what we have been doing. At least initially, this model fits biomass well, and these companies are likely to succeed if they can continue innovating and balancing their product offerings with their resource and the market demands. If they do indeed become successful, highly profitable companies, they will represent a model that others can follow as well.